until it's there. Yeah. All right. So thank you very much. I will uh, uh, speak today about the library of the White Monastery. So Coptic literature is in many regards similar with any other literature preserved in other languages of the Christian East. But there is something which puts it in a class of its own, and that's, that is the fragmentary character of the manuscripts, of the Coptic manuscripts. So Coptic, intact Coptic manuscripts are basically uh, rarities. Most of our Coptic manuscripts came down to us as dismember leaves and fragments which are scattered a little bit all over the world as uh, uh, Frank showed uh, uh, before. So one of the main tasks of the Coptologist is to piece together these dismembered manuscripts. Just a few uh, words about the out outline of my paper in order to know what I will discuss uh, um, uh, today. So I will uh, start by talking about the Copts and their language, what Coptic means in fact, and then I will uh, document the uh, white monastery, the lo where, is it, where is it situated in Egypt, from where it, its name comes, and most, its most important argument, right, Shenute the Great. Then I will talk about the dispersal of the manuscripts from the White Monastery, and I will finish the presentation with uh, a documentation of the virtual reconstruction of the codices. So, what means Coptic, and who are the Copts? In most of our modern languages, uh, the word comes from Latin, right? Cofti, coftite. But the Latin word is actually uh, filtered through Arabic. It comes from Arabic because in, after the conquest of Egypt in 671, the Arabs called the local uh, population Gypt or Gypt or, or, or Gypt. And uh, in order to de differentiate them from the Byzantines, from the Greek, which the Arabs call a room, right? And this word, uh, Gypt or Gypt, is nothing else than the Greek Aegyptios, you know? Because perhaps some of you know that in Arabic what matters are the radicals, you know, the, the consonants. So basically, the uh, radicals are the same, you know? When uh, in the Middle Ages, the Western scholars um, came into contact with the, in the Middle Ages, the Western scholars took this word from, from, uh, from Arabic without knowing that it is in fact derived uh, from Greek. And therefore we have uh, uh, in our modern languages this uh, word, Copt. Uh, Coptic is the, the Egyptian, the ancient Egyptian language, the last stage of the ancient Egyptian language, written with uh, Greek characters. And in addition, they have some um, indigenous Egyptian signs for those uh, uh, sounds which don't exist in Greek. Coptic is a dialectal language, so we have more than a dozen of uh, 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 Coptic uh, dialects documented until now. The most important are the Sahidic dialect, which is the literary dialect of the Valley of the Nile in the ancient times. Then we have the Bohiric dialect, which was spoken in the Nile Delta. And Today, Bohairic is still the uh, language, the liturgical language of the Coptic Church. Then we have the Fayumic dialect, which was spoken in the area of the Fayum oasis, and other minor dialects, which all disappeared by the sixth century, like the Oxyrinkai dialect, which, is, uh, which was spoken in the area of Oxyrinkus in Middle Egypt. Just a few words about Shenute. Uh, of Atripe and uh, the White Monastery. So the White Monastery about which you uh, have already heard in, uh, in uh, Frank's pre presentation is situated near Sohag in Upper Egypt. Yeah. So it's, I have here a map of Egypt. 
So this is Sohag, and the White Monastery, it is situated uh, in the desert, but not far from the cultivated land, you see here. In antiquity, the largest uh, town in the area was not Sohag, Sohag is just a modern uh, town. The most important town was on the other uh, uh, side of the Nile, it's called Achmim, the Greek Panopolis, or uh, Shmin in uh, Coptic. This was the most important uh, uh, town in the area. It was a stronghold of uh, Hellenistic culture. We have uh, there, uh, fr from there came a series of Greek epic uh, poets, the so-called wandering poets as Alan uh, Cameron uh, uh, called them the most important of which is Nonus of Panopolis and also uh, Cyrus of Panopolis who uh, became the confidant of uh, Empress uh, Eudocia in the uh, fifth century. The White Monastery was founded by Pugyol, by a certain Pugyol who uh, was Shenute's maternal uncle. Pugyol tried to implement the Pacomian uh, model when he uh, founded this monastery. After Pugyol uh, followed another Archimandrite, which apparently was named Ebonach. Shenute refers to him in his writings as the second father. And after uh, Ebonach followed Shenute, the, the most important Archimandrite of the White Monastery. White Monastery comprised, in fact, a confederation of uh, monastery, which was formed of the monastery of Shenute, the monastery of uh, Pushoi, and a nunnery, a monastery for nuns, which, uh, which was situated in the um, town of Atripe, more south. Now there is a, a problem related to, to the nomenclature of this place. We call it today White Monastery. This is derived from Arabic, the Relabiad. But in ancient times, this name is not uh, attested. The ancient documents call the place the Monastery of Shenute, from the name of its import, most important argument, right, or the Monastery of uh, uh, Atripe. The White Monastery was used for the first time in Arabic sources, not earlier than the uh, 14th century. It seems that Shenute of Atripe lived um, from about 347 and 466. It is uh, a bit astonishing, so 118 years. Many scholars don't believe, I for one don't believe this is true, but there are nevertheless some hints in Shenute's uh, writings which suggest that he uh, had a quite long life. And if not uh, 118 years, uh, nevertheless, uh, somewhere close to that number. There are about 100 uh, codices which uh, transmit the works of Shenute, all of them, or almost all of them, from the White Man uh, Monastery and none of them in intact. So they have all survived with uh, their leaves torn and scattered all over the world. The corpus of the writings of Shenute was pieced together by Stephen Emel in uh, his doctoral dissertation, which he published in 2004. This, the, the literary corpus of Shenute is um, divided in two uh, broad um, uh, categories. The canons, which most of the manuscripts contain the canons, are uh, organized in nine volumes. These are texts which are uh, intended for the uh, monastic audience from the confederation of uh, Shenute's monastery. Then there are eight volumes of discourses, that is homilies, which he uh, pronounce with uh, uh, special occasions or uh, deliver for various uh, feasts. To the eighth volume of, um, uh, that is the last volume of, uh, of the discourses, are appended the letters of Shenute. So uh, we have uh, correspondence with the patriarchs of, uh, patriarchs of Alexandria and with other notables people of the uh, day. And from this correspondence, it is clear that Shenute occupied 
a quite important place in the history of uh, Coptic Egypt. In fact, the central place in the uh, uh, monastic movement of up Upper Egypt. Therefore, it is really surprising that the historical sources concerning uh, this character are exclusively preserved in Coptic. So the Greek and the Latin sources concerning Egyptian monasticism during the fourth and fifth century, strangely enough, completely ignore Shenute. Probably this has to do with the Damnatio Memoriae. He, after the split of Chalcedon in 451, Shenute uh, took the side of the Patriarch of Alexandria, Dioscorus, and probably uh, as a consequence, his name was banned in the international Greek uh, Byzantine church. The fact that the White Monastery had a library already during the period of Shenute is clear from his writings. In his writings, Shenute already refers to books being stored in his uh, library. In, uh, in, in his monastery, I'm sorry. After Shenute, after the death of Shenute, the library increases. Shenute becomes an important saint in Coptic Egypt, and therefore the monastery becomes very important and uh, is a pil uh, becomes also an important pilgrimage place. Therefore, many notable uh, Egyptian Christians from the area of, of uh, Achmim donate uh, books to the uh, uh, monastery, and therefore the library increases significantly. So I think we can estimate that around the year 1000 CE, the uh, monastery possessed about uh, 1000 manuscripts. We don't know much about the decline of the library but it seems that by mid 18th century, this is the moment when the first fragments from the Mo White Monastery um, arrive in Europe in Western collections, it seems that uh, the library already fell into decay because none of the manuscripts is intact by that time. Just a few words about the dispersal of the White Monastery manuscripts in modern times. It seems that the first report about Coptic books being kept in the library of the White Monastery belongs to a English travelers, a certain, a certain Charles Perry, who uh, left a written report of, his, um, uh, of a trip he uh, made in Egypt. And Perry reports, I quote, got intelligence of a famous ancient convent at about three leagues distance from Achmim, situate to the southwest of it at the foot of the Libyan mountains. And this convent we went to visit. This convent, which is very ancient and celebrated, is called the White Convent. And we yet find in it many manuscripts wrote on parchment in the old Coptic character, as they say, though somewhat like Greek which is now grown obsolete and out of knowledge, end of quotation. So this is the report of uh, Charles Perry. It is unlikely that he uh, possessed uh, 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 fragments from the White Monastery, but it, it is nevertheless interesting uh, to know that uh, before the mid uh, 18th century, the manuscripts were seen by Western travelers. A few years after he published uh, this report, the first manuscripts from the White Monastery uh, come out uh, and they arrive in uh, uh, Western European collections. By then, uh, at that time, at that point, no one knew the exact source of, of these fragments. The first collection, as Frank uh, anticipated, which was formed is that of the Cardinal uh, Stefano Borgia, the head of the Propaganda Fide in the Vatican. This uh, uh, collection was cataloged by uh, Georg Zoega in, in a catalog published in 1810. After the death of uh, Borgia, the collection was split. A part remained in the Vatican, whereas the other went to Naples. And this part of the collection was cataloged again by uh, Paola Buzzi in uh, 2009. 
About the same time with Stefano Borgia, that is around uh, mid 18th century, a German scholar who lived and uh, taught in Oxford, Charles or Karl Voide, gathered um, a similar collection uh, which is now kept in the Clarendon Press in Oxford. Also to the mid uh, 18th century dates the collection of Jacopo Nani today kept in uh, Venice. This collection was also cataloged by a pioneer of uh, Coptic studies, Giovanni Luigi Mingarelli in 1785. When Napoleon went to uh, his uh, first uh, Egyptian and Syrian uh, mission at the end of the 19th century, uh, one of the officers of the army of Napoleon, Jean-Jacques Marcel, acquired a number of similar fragments which he sent to Paris and are today kept in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. A little bit later, that is uh, the first half of the 19th century, similar collections were formed by various individuals. I will mention only Robert Curzon, his collection is today in the British Library, Henry Tatum, uh, Golenishchev, an, um, a, Ru a Russian Orientalist, his collection is today in uh, Moscow. Now, some of the scholars of that period realized that some of the leaves of these scattered leaves are paleographically related. But unfortunately, given the uh, situation, the historical situation of that time, none of them manages to travel between archives and to connect the leaves in order to piece, the, piece together the, uh, the manuscripts. I will uh, uh, offer you a quotation from uh, uh, one of the pioneers of Coptic studies, uh, Georg Zoega, who uh, cataloged uh, uh, co the, the Coptic manuscripts of, of uh, Stefano Borgia, and who uh, writes to a friend of his, to Arsène Thiebaud, about the efforts to uh, catalog the, the, the collection of, uh, of, uh, of the Cardinal Borgia. I quote, this is the main idea of my work. This is the direction and the plan followed in my book, that is, in his catalog. I can say that I, I have created myself the collection that I'm consulting because, because most of what came from Egypt were only sheets of parchment detached from the books to which they belonged and thrown together in such confusion that it took me a lot of time and fatigue to elaborate upon and discover their points of contact and dissimilitude. It was only by checking sometimes the writing, the taste for ornaments, the size and quality of the parchment, and other circumstances even more painstaking that I managed to form from these scattered leaves books, or, or at least consecutive fragments, to organize and distribute them into classes." End of quotation. So this is what, um, what Zoega writes about his uh, experience with the uh, fragments from the White Monastery. Unfortunately, as I said, uh, each scholar at that time was able to work only on one ar archive. And furthermore, none of them knew the source of these uh, manuscripts. They only knew that, that they are from Egypt, and that was basically it. The situation changed drastically in 1883 uh, when a French Egyptologist, Gaston Maspero, discovered inside the walls of the White Monastery a little room which uh, whose floor was full of uh, uh, manuscripts, of uh, fra manuscript fragments. Only at that time it became clear that all the other related fragments must come from the White Monastery. Maspero tries to, uh, uh, sorry, just to show the location of this little room that Maspero discovered inside the walls of the monastery. It is basically here, the room. You have to climb some stairs. It's in the church. Here is the church of the White Monastery. And it is here, the, the, the secret room where Maspero discovered 
thousands and thousands of manuscript fragments. Here is another location where recently a team from Yale University discovered a significant number of other uh, fragments. Here is um, one of, Maspero published several reports of his discovery, but here is uh, one which I selected from a, a, a review to Georg Steindorf's edition of the Apocalypse of Elijah. I quote, they were mostly books out of usage written on parchment or thick paper, ke once kept in the library of the monastery and then discarded, either because they lacked too many pages or because the idioms in which they were written, the Theban dialect and the dialect of Achmim, were not comprehensible to the monks anymore. A sort of reverence for the holy character of the topics they treated prevented the monks to burn them or throw them outside, so that they placed them pell-mell in a storage room together with torn clothes, broken vases, and useless church objects, all kind of things meant for worship or for the edification of the believers that can can gather in a monastery over the centuries, end of quotation. This is how Maspero describes his, um, his um, uh, discovery of the fragments. Maspero tries to buy the fragments, but the monks refuse to, uh, to, to sell them to him. But nevertheless, not uh, um, uh, uh, Soon after 1883, when Maspero discovers this uh, deposit of manuscripts, fragments start to emerge from the cache, and they are sold on the antiquities market to various individuals. Maspero was uh, the head of the service of antiquities in, uh, in uh, Cairo, and he tries to confiscate from the dealers all the batches of uh, fragments. And he manages, indeed, to uh, recuperate most of them, which he sends to the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. Nevertheless, many other fragments, thousands and thousands of fragments, are bought by various other individuals, and they form the collections which are today in Vienna, London, uh, Leiden, Berlin, Moscow, Oslo, and so on, to name just a few of, uh, the, of the collections who uh, possess fragments from the White Monastery. I will give you just one example, the case of Jens Lieblein, a Norwegian uh, Egyptologist who purchased fragments from the White Monastery during a trip in Egypt in 1887-1888, the winter of 1887-1888. And um, Lieblein left um, a written report about the circumstances in which he uh, acquired these fragments. I quote, during my stay in Egypt in the winter of 1887-1888, I came across some fragments of Copt Coptic parchment manuscripts. While I was in Luxor, an Arab came in the darkness of the night with a whole basket full of Coptic fragments. They were torn leaves, all worn, full of holes, destroyed and damaged in various ways. Some were larger and so, so well preserved that their original format could be seen. Others were smaller, only containing half or a third or a fourth part of a leaf, both by length and breadth. Most of them, however, were quite small pieces with only a few words on them. They are written on parchment in the Theban dialect and consequently derived from a Coptic monastery in the vicinity of old Thebes. The writing is mostly nice and clear and easily readable, especially on one side, while the other side has been faded and worn. Despite their not so promising aspect, I nevertheless bought them, since I hope to get at least something out of them, end of quotation. And indeed, uh, here are a few uh, fragments kept today in the collection of the University of Oslo, which belonged to the basket full of uh, Coptic fragments that uh, Lieblein describes. And as we can see, they are indeed uh, in a quite bad state of uh, conservation. Nevertheless, even so, they are quite important because they join to other fragments kept elsewhere. And therefore, we can recuperate bits of text which otherwise would have been lost. So these colored photographs 
are from Liebline's collection, and these are uh, fragments kept elsewhere in other parts of the world. So this is what I had to say about the scattering of the fragments. Now I will discuss the reconstruction, the virtual reconstruction of the White Monastery uh, Library, and I distinguish a few phases in the reconstruction of this library. First of all, at the end of the 19th century was the autoptic examination of the fragments. At that time, photography was not easily accessible, but scholars traveled between archives. They took notes, they tried to remember hands, scribal hands, and make connections you know, with other manuscripts, uh, with other fragments kept elsewhere. So it was a really difficult time, but even so, some uh, some notable um, uh, progresses have been made. And I will mention just Oscar von Lehm, um, a Russian coptologist who uh, managed to connect uh, paleographically uh, many fragments. And the most important of them, Walter Ewing Crum, uh, one of the most important coptologists, who uh, left us uh, at least three catalogs of Coptic manuscripts, which document quite well the uh, manuscript fragments from the White Monastery and reconstructs uh, many codices. The second phase started once photography was more widely used. It is the period when um, photography was possible, so scholars could compare fragments on the basis of the photographic support. And I will mention here the photographic archive which uh, Louis Théophile de Faure, a Belgian uh, coptologist, gathered in uh, the University of Louvain. He uh, gathered this collection for his, um, uh, for his edition of the lives of uh, Pacomius. So he realized the White Monastery possessed several manuscripts of the lives of Pacomius. So he realized the importance of these manuscripts and therefore uh, gathered this photographic archive. Another important photographic archive was uh, collected by uh, Henri or uh, Henry uh, Ivernat or Hivernat, um, another Belgian uh, uh, coptologist who moved uh, to the United States. He taught at the Catholic University in uh, Washington, D.C. And his collection of photos from the White Monastery manuscripts is still kept in the Catholic University. The third and the fourth uh, phases are represented by the um, uh, large usage of microfilms and then later by the digital revolution. It was Tito Orlandi who uh, made a real progress in the study of the White Monastery manuscript in 1969 when he uh, founded the Corpus dei Manuscritti Copti Let Letterari project. Orlandi acquired uh, microfilms of most of the Coptic uh, manuscripts from most of the collections around the world and he stored these uh, microfilm rolls in the first in Milano. He started the project in, in Milano, later transferred it to uh, La Sapienza University in Rome, where he uh, acted as a professor. And uh, uh, this uh, 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 collection of microfilms still exists today. It is uh, kept in the uh, Augustinianum in uh, Rome. Once the digital revolution occurred, Orlandi digitized all the microfilms and they are available even today on, um, on, uh, uh, um, in digital format. Uh, they are um, uh, available, the, the digital archive of the Corpus dei Manuscritti Letterari is uh, the most important repository of uh, manuscripts from the uh, White Monastery. And he created also a database which you can consult online, the cmcl.it, where uh, the manuscripts from the White Monastery are, uh, are reconstructed virtually. Additionally, to, in, in addition to the 
to the project of Tito Orlandi. There are other uh, projects which are narrower in uh, scope. I mentioned here only the uh, project of uh, the late Karlheinz Schüssler, Biblia Coptica, our uh, Göttingen Old Testament project. We try to piece together only the Old Testament white monastery uh, man uh, manuscripts. Then Diliana Atanasova's uh, project on the liturgical manuscripts from the White Monastery, and there's an international team led by uh, Stephen Emel, who, uh, which reconstructs the codices of um, the works of Shenoude. Just a few words about the challenges that we encounter as Coptologists when we deal with such a fragmentary and uh, dispersed uh, material. As I said before, Coptic literature is a literature of fragments. Coptic intact manuscripts are rather exceptions. The rule, uh, the, the typical Coptic manuscript is an incomplete and dispersed uh, um, uh, manuscript. So in this situation, you can imagine that the identification of the fragments is a difficult task. We don't have the same tools which uh, Greek uh, scholars, for example, have at hand. We don't have a thesaurus, lingue greche, in order to identify uh, small fragments. So uh, it's more or less a work of erudition to identify the content of, um, of, uh, of any uh, given Coptic fragment. Then the codicological reconstruction of the manuscripts, it's also a very difficult task because most of the leaves of these manuscripts are lost forever. We typically have 10% of each uh, uh, Sahidic manuscript from the White Monastery preserved. So the rest, the 90% of, uh, of them are basically uh, lost uh, forever. So in this situation, their codicological reconstruction is really challenging. To uh, pack up now this uh, uh, discussion, I will uh, mention that there are vestiges of about 700 manuscripts that we managed to identify until now, but the number continues to increase constantly, so it was obviously uh, larger, the library of the White Monastery, and uh, very important to underline that these manuscripts contain most of the religious texts that circulated in Coptic. Therefore, to some extent, the codicological reconstruction of the White Monastery uh, manuscripts is coextensive with the reconstruction of Coptic literature. Therefore, it is really uh, an important task for, for us. It is only when we will manage to uh, identify all these scattered fragments, when we'll piece together the, uh, the codices, only then we will understand uh, better the history of uh, the Coptic literature. Thank you. So. Uh, I have one question about the uh, actual monastery. There was a, a area below the 